Radio Free Santa Clarita presents The Talk of Santa Clarita A podcast about issues involving Santa Clarita and the surrounding valley With your host, Stephen Daniels Episode 162 A Special Conversation with Christy Smith Part two, the nitty gritty. And now let's see what the talk of Santa Clarita is. And remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. All right, so we're back again. Uh, Good part- to be back again. <laughs> Strangely enough, we're in the same <laughs> clothes. <laughs> um, Okay, you know, I, I really watched the election quite a bit. I watched both you and 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 Mike a yeah. lot on on and when you guys did, you kind of did a debate. Didn't really, I mean, it wasn't really a debate, but mm-hmm. it was kind of. Um, and I'm confused about Mike Garcia a lot about about a lot of the things he, he said, and uh, I mean, he really talked about your about the state quite a bit, mm-hmm. and. Um, he continues to talk a lot about the state and yeah. government, state government, and everything. He says he doesn't want the con- the country to turn into what California's. Oh well, heaven forbid! Should we have a country that has a balanced budget amendment and a rainy day fund, and you know all the things that California has going for yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's play a little game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called federal or state. Okay. These are these are issues that uh, Mike Garcia has brought up uh, early in his campaign. He brought up Prop Thirteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, he posted about pres- preserving uh, Prop 13. Is that a state or a federal issue? That is a state issue. State issue. Mm-hmm. So nothing to do with Congress at all? No. No. Okay. Uh, sending kids back to school. He's been campaigning about trying to you know, uh, get the kids to go back to school, sending yeah. letters to the governor and stuff like that. State or federal? Uh, that is a state and local issue that mm-hmm. was always going to be entirely dependent on, first of all, resources that were available and what local infection rates were. And the mm-hmm. guidance from the CDC early on was just limited based on the data that was out there, right? Mm-hmm. We needed a, a greater data set to know whether kids were going to be safe in those environments, to know whether uh, teachers, often older and, and initially in some of those higher risk categories, were right. going to be safe without being vaccinated, right? So. Um, Th- those are decisions that needed to be made at the state and local level with help from the federal level in mm-hmm. terms of data and resources. Okay, so technically, not really a congressman's job. Not really a congressman's job, Okay. No. Um, at his uh, recent ta- uh, town hall that he did, the, the, the telephone town hall, did mm-hmm. you listen to it by the no. chance? Okay. He talked about the, the California 14 free way mm-hmm. um, and wanting to do some work on it. Mm-hmm. Is that state or federal? It's a state highway, right? Well, yeah, it's state highway. But, you know, as I mentioned yesterday in our <laughs> interview was that, you know, President Biden has this great proposal for mm-hmm. a federal in- infrastructure bill. Uh, one of the things that we need in the area where we are, if mm-hmm. we're going to continue to have economic growth, is better transportation. Sure. And if you are someone from the Antelope Valley who goes in the community up there, they call it going down below mm-hmm. for work, you want to see that 14 freeway improved, sure. right, for greater capacity. The other thing we need to do is uh, double track metro through a few key stretches mm-hmm. uh, in and out to have that more available to people. But our local economic growth, jobs growth, and our ability to continue to develop housing where it makes sense to bring the cost of housing Mm -hmm. down, right? Because we've got a housing affordability problem. All of that hinges on infrastructure investment. So it would be great to have some federal dollars put towards that, coupled with some state resources and then some, you know, great state construction folks to to do that work. Okay, so it's kind of federal kind of state? A a little above. A little above. Yeah. Okay. Does he have any authority over the governor? He sent a lot of letters to the governor. Yeah, he really likes picking on the governor, but no, ultimately, no. Nothing. Mm -mm. Nothing. So... Uh, he also uh, was quite obsessed with AB5 is, yes. and, and, and the gig economy situation right. like that. Right. Anything to do with the uh, federal government as far as AB5? Well, there was a new uh, act in the House, the PRO Act, which models some of its components on uh, what was done here with AB5 in California. And it really just it, it sets up a system in which workers are not misclassified Mm -hmm. also protects continues to protect workers rights to unionize if they choose to um, and collectively bargain 
Uh, so, you know, it is, it's at the federal level now. But again, a reminder that here in the state of California, right. I was part of the cleanup bills mm -hmm. on, on AB5, right? The fixes for uh, freelancers and contractors who had kind of unintentionally been left out of, of phase one of development. Um, but then what we've seen subsequently with the passage of Prop 22, especially in this economy, is a lot of gig workers in a really bad space. I don't, I don't know if you saw it, but there was that young man, he posted a video to social media and he was a, a delivery driver mm -hmm. and ended up um, on a full shift that is his second job on a full shift. He only made 50 cents just based on how the pay worked for what it was that he was doing and providing. And at one delivery ended up having to pay a parking toll and, you know, some other stuff. And so that's, that's the things that we want to protect against, right? We want to make sure if, if people are working, even if they're gigging in that second job, yeah. they're making a minimum of what the federal minimum wage is mm -hmm. and that they've got those those important job protections. They're not being misclassified. Obviously, my dogs are very passionate. They about are. It. Your dogs feel, I'm sure they're <laughs> well-paid dogs. Well, uh, 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 one of my dogs actually makes money as an Uber driver. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I guess the reason I bring all that up is it just seems to me like Mike Garcia seems to have run for the wrong office. Well, you know, and, and the, look, the, the, the go-to of the California GOP right now is to mm -hmm. bag on California. Yeah. Um, but as I said, when we first started talking about this, California has a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. California has had a budget surplus. Mm -hmm. California puts away that budget surplus yeah. now in a rainy day fund. Um, we are a state the size of a small country for 40 million people here. Yeah. That certainly presents its challenges. Do we have challenges we still need to overcome? Absolutely. And I know a lot of really good, hardworking, diligent people in Sacramento um, who do that, go to work every day to do that job. But all things considered, California is a pretty darn good place to live. What do you think about the regulation situation with California? I mean, Bill Maher does a joke every week about how uh, he about his solar. solar. Yeah. yeah, that one I I am mad for Bill Maher because that just shouldn't be happening. He should be able to hook up his solar and mm. be on the grid. But I again, mean, you know, like look, I will I will admit, yes, there's always more that could be done mm -hmm. and and could be done. It seems better. like there's so much red tape for any kind of building. And program. and that's where I think we go wrong. I think mm -hmm. you know, regulation exists to protect people, consumers, and the environment. Mm -hmm. Where we go wrong is that when we regulate for the, the fun of regulating, but we're not necessarily then going back and doing the research if we are protecting what we intended to protect mm -hmm. with the regulation, right? And if there are ways that we could be doing this that are much more streamlined and expensive and easier to accommodate for people. You know, I, one of the cases, a uh, piece of casework that I had when I was serving in the state legislatures, we had someone who was a local restaurant owner and um, Cal OSHA had been called by, a, a, by an employee there and they had bought the business from someone else and didn't realize that the a stand mixer that they had needed these special arms around it. And mm -hmm. so it ended up being this colo like insurmountable fine for someone operating a small business to get over. Now, from my perspective, the way that we fix that is that with the oversight body, we give some latitude and some flexibility to, to write you know, a, a prescriptive plan that says, all right, can you manage to get this fixed in the next however many days? Right. And if so, you know, is kind of, we're gonna significantly reduce the fine, we'll follow up to make sure it's been fixed, you know, no harm, no foul. But instead, you know, kind of sitting on that fine, so which the business, you know, owner has to pay, not giving them the resources to do the repair. You know what I mean? I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's like this wrong-headed mentality sometimes in the regulatory space where we just need to be um, employing some common sense mm -hmm. and getting things right and, and making it about getting businesses uh, to a point where they are flourishing in the environment instead of suffering um, when they simply can't afford it. And as long as we are always, we're protecting the worker, the consumer, the environment, right. you know, we're in a good spot. Do you, I mean, is that your general philosophy as a politician to, you know, those three? Yeah, I think, I think get things out of the way sometimes mm -hmm. makes sense. I mean, sometimes we've simply overdone it out of an abundance of good intentions, mm -hmm. but then we didn't go back to look at what the consequences were, and, right. and there are some real downsides. Now, AB5 being an example of that, wouldn't you say? Or? Yeah, which is why we did the cleanup on it, mm -hmm. you know, that we did. There were some classes of workers, freelance journalists in particular, where we realized that that, you know, the media space has changed so much right. that we needed to grant more latitude there. Some healthcare uh, professionals, some people in the arts and entertainment space. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that that work will continue you know, to evolve and, and to be done. Um, it's certainly never the intention to make life harder for people. Well, I think... Um 
you know, it, it's all how you look at it, you know, in the sense of uh, is a bill something that's going to be adapted and grow over time? Or are you just saying this is law, this is the way it's going to be? Because yeah. if, you, if you look at any law, you know, the, you know, Obamacare by itself, you know, has flaws. You yeah. know, so does AB5. Well, but, but, I mean, historically, right, prohibitions against um, – people of different ethnic groups marrying, right? There yeah. are so many laws, women not being able to vote. Um, there are so many laws that we've taken off the book I, over time. I, I point that out to a lot of people about the, if you want to talk about the Constitution being strict, then you have to accept the fact that three, four, that some people are only three-fourths of a person. Right. Which we find abhorrent today, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, yes, and that is part of the beauty of that document and then the state uh, you know, constitutions that are modeled after that, it's, it, it, they are intended to be expansive. And it is intended for people who serve in legislatures to continue to do that work. Mm-hmm. Tell, me, tell me, what, is, what are you, is your most proud moment as, as an assembly person? Um, you know what? It actually happened recently, after, after the fact. Um, several bills I got passed, all of them were focused on mm-hmm. you know, either transparency or good governance or kind of doing things the right way or supporting people. Um, one that uh, I was able to get passed and signed by the governor had been a Women's Caucus priority bill for a few cycles prior uh, to me getting there and some you know, great women carrying it. Uh, I showed up at the assembly. There wasn't anybody who had room for it in their bill package. Uh, Lorena Gonzalez said to me, would, would you like to take this? The sponsors would be interested in you carrying it this time. And it was a bill to allow victims of human trafficking in California to get some financial benefit from our victims' compensation fund. Um, in the previous attempts, Jerry Brown had vetoed it. They didn't have enough override to get it out of the legislature. So I gave it a try. I mean, it was sticky. It was challenging. It was hard to get it out of public safety because there's, um, you know, a lot of concern about how the Victims' Compensation Fund is used. But we passed it. Governor signs it. And we just got data from some of our sponsoring groups last week that in the first year of its implementation, so the last calendar year, um, about 85 individuals in the state of California have been helped with grants of about $13,700 to get back on their feet. That's great. After they've been victims of human trafficking. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, well and that's thank you, and it that is that's the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to ask you about the Newsom recall. What do you think about that right now? Um, look, I think it's a really cynical use of a tool that was meant to be used at a time when an elected official has done something particularly egregious. And every public official, whether it's you know Gretchen Whitmer or or Gavin Newsom in the beginning of this crisis was navigating absent a lot of Uh data and information and and resources. We we didn't know exactly where we were going with this. So I think it is, it's cynical in the sense that, you know, every elected leader, every executive elected leader is going to go through hard times and you don't pull the rug out from under them when they're trying to do that. I think a lot of people who signed it, the over a million Uh signatures that they have now, I think if it was required to say at the top, this is going to cost the state of California over $80 million dollars. And if, big if, because I don't think they're going to be successful, if they were successful, this person will serve for a year. I mean, it takes most one people. Year. Yeah, one year. It takes most people a couple of months to pull a government together. They're sure. supporting people. Um, with a legislature with super majorities in both houses of the opposing party, if they were successful. It is, it is to me, the, the analogy I always use is it's if you had a club of 100 people, and I, I told you this, a, a club of 100 people, and you had an overwhelming majority vote, to, for your pre, for the president of the club, and just ten people didn't like it. Yeah, you know, because it, it's only ten percent of the the votes or the voters that have yeah. to register voters that have to uh, successfully do the recall, and you know, it's sort of like those ten people don't like it, so you have to do the election all over again just because ten people don't want right, to. Right, right, and that that threshold was, I think, intentionally designed to be small so that there wouldn't be a barrier in the event that an elected official mm-hmm. did something particularly yeah. egregious, and it was far enough away from an election cycle that something. Really Really had to be done about mm-hmm. it. It is not meant to be weaponized and used as it is now. Frankly, like the filibuster yeah. in the Senate, right? This is like very parallel to what we're seeing in the Senate with the use of the filibuster. These were well-intentioned tools mm-hmm. um, intended to empower um, the minority, um, but in a positive way, yeah. not not in a shut everything down uh, way. 
I, I don't have a problem with the filibuster. I just think you should have to earn it. I mean, yeah. you know oh, what I mean? You, you should have to stand up and do the speech. Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's what gets me is that they don't have to do that. Right. It's like, they just have, to, they just have to invoke it. Yeah. 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 No, the, you should be doing the, the uh, Jimmy Stewart, Mr. Smith goes to Absolutely. Washington on the floor. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, let me ask you about uh, Mario Cuomo. Because you, you've been a... a Mario, big, dad? No, excuse me. Andrew. 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 Oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I knew where you were going. Yeah, uh, yeah. no. I, the reason I bring it up is because you've been a strong supporter, obviously, of women's rights. And, yeah, and, and and listening to the accuser. Right. Um, what are your, What are your thoughts about Andrew Cuomo? Uh, there needs to be a, a full and thorough investigation. Should he step down now? Um, not my call to make, but I certainly think. Um, there what should if it was your call? I'm I think I, I think at a minimum, yeah. um, he shouldn't be alone in a room with staffers anymore mm -hmm. right now till the investigation is completed yeah. but i think what we need to do what we need to do on behalf of women though mm -hmm. is set the standard that these investigations will occur and they will be swift mm -hmm. and that there is a transparent reporting mm -hmm. of what comes out of that and unfortunately still we are in this era where it comes down to a he said she said and those are always where look it's it, women don't come out with these claims willy-nilly no one wants to be put on blast on social media right. for having making made those kind of claims. Um, and most of the time, well in excess of over you know 90% of the time, the claims are substantiated when people have experienced What, what bothers me, though, is there, there, there's a danger in convicting the man or the individual before you know, an investigation is done. I mean, they're already screaming for him to step down. Yeah, and that's that's the trade-off, right? And that's why I say swift, because mm -hmm. you don't want these things to go on and right. on, given the nature of, of the subject matter and, and the victims involved. Um, it, it should be swift. If the allegations are true, should he step down? Yes. Why? You know... Let me, let me tell you... Li oh. Liability-wise, it is a problem, but it is... We've been litigating this over and over again yeah. in the public square. It's it's not. It is one thing when it happens outside the workplace, yeah. and and what happens in your private life is your private life. Right. Where where the line has to be drawn is is in the workplace. Should Bill Clinton have resigned? By modern by current standards, um, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike has said he's against the Green New Deal. As a matter of fact, one of the infrastructure bills that he voted against said it was too Green New Dealish. Um, I didn't know that was an adjective. But that, that, is a, that is an in-depth analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the Green New Deal? Um, I am a fan. I am a supporter. I co-sponsored mm -hmm. the resolution in, in the state assembly mm -hmm. in support of it. Um, and especially now, I've been, you know, really fortunate to have Speaker Rendon appoint me to the Delta Stewardship Council, which deals with uh, water conservation mm -hmm. and water conveyance statewide. And the council itself has just commissioned um, a resiliency, a mm -hmm. climate resiliency uh, plan as part of this work that we're doing. And, and just yesterday, we did uh, just this fascinating uh, researcher has done a study on weather patterns in California. Mm -hmm. Our rainy season has shrunk in the last 20 years by 27 days there's wow. 27 fewer days of precipitation that means that's more days for fuel brush fuel to mm. to get dry to get crispy um it means really interesting things like i was geeking out with you earlier uh salmon in the state that migrate to spawn mm -hmm. um the surges in the water flows where they yeah. migrate to and from the, the flow isn't there so that's 27 but fewer that's a good days thing, for them what, to what a lot of people don't know is salmon most of them are uh, undocumented <laughs> But we eat them, <laughs> <laughs> and it's part of our food supply, and we need them. I don't, no, I, I don't think most of them are, are undocumented, but um, <laughs> but we need them, and and we need they are an important part of that ecosystem. They and um, we we are messing up big time if we don't deal with climate change as the crisis that it is. It is a crisis, and it needs to be taken seriously. The more progressive uh, branch of the Democratic Party have accused you of not being supportive, supportive of Medicare for all. Is that yes. the case? I believe all people have a right to health care. Mm -hmm. I think what they have an issue with is that I have said I am agnostic about how we get there. I know people feel very strongly and very vehemently mm -hmm. in their passions about single-payer Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of people in this country still 
whose interaction with the government maybe has been they had to stand online at the DMV for four hours, or they were, heaven forbid, if they were one of these people recently working with EDD in California and trying to get mm -hmm. their unemployment assistance. And if that is their concept of how the government delivers for them, sure. you ask one of those people, do you want the government handling their your health care? Mm -hmm. They're going to be resistant sure. to that, right? And we have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful of the fact that there are a lot of services that government provides that we're not doing really well right now and we need to fix those too. But that's the mindset where people are. Which is not to say though, as we discussed in the earlier part of this interview, that we should not be allowing great latitude for states mm -hmm. to try to work on this issue. And if they can get to the point where they can provide a system that is either hybrid or single payer that works mm -hmm. for them, that their constituents support, that gets everybody coverage, they should do that. What the COVID crisis has laid bare is the fractures that we knew were there in our healthcare system. Some people with literally right. no access right. in their community, right? Counties, even in the state of California, where there were not ventilators or ICU beds in a particular community, small community hospital, right? So there is so much more that we need to do in our quest to cover everybody. Mm -hmm. We need more points of access. We need more providers. We need more doctors. We need more specialists. We need more skilled uh, nursing facilities for our aging population. There is a whole lot more we need to do, but the most urgent and emergent piece of this is getting everyone some kind of coverage. No one should have to go bankrupt because they get sick. Mm -hmm. um, my fear is, is that in getting hung up on that label of Medicare for all as yeah. the e, b, e, e, be all end all of, of the policy solution is that we are letting what some folks think is the perfect be the enemy of the good. And to me right now, the good is let's get everybody covered. Let's be the America that we know that we can be that put a man on mm -hmm. the moon that has solved other problems. Let's figure out how to do this so that people are not suffering so that they can see a doctor when they're sick. There is something and, crazy about needing money. If you're sick, you know, going going bankrupt over medical bills because yeah, you, you know, yeah, and okay. and having it in some cases, in many cases, tied to employment. That's like what I was saying earlier about mm -hmm. this, the huge number of small business owners who aren't the big corporate guys, but who mm -hmm. would love they, you know, their their employees are like family to right. them. You know, the restaurant owner or the the auto shop owner, um, they'd love to be able to cover their employees. They're simply mm -hmm. priced out of the market. So let's create a secondary market with a public option, mm -hmm. government run or go you know government nonprofit entity tied um, that allows them to be able to, to buy in and to do that at a rate that's affordable. Just for the record here, um, because uh, anyone who's seen the Mike Garcia podcast I did with him, I had explained to him what a public option is. He may know what it is now, yeah, but he did not know when he was running for Congress initially. Can you tell us what a public option is? Yeah, a public option would be a government run health insurer, health coverage provider mm -hmm. that would, for now, compete in, you know, in the private market with mm -hmm. private providers that are out there. Now, you know, I think there's also room, though, for that to be some kind of you know, nonprofit government partnership mm -hmm. where that's delivered. There's some good examples of that in LA where that's happening. Um, but again, we, you know, we're smarter than that. We've got some of the, the smartest healthcare providers, economists, um, great people in this space. And I, I am frankly saying that maybe the politicians don't have all of the answers. If I'm president right now, I am bringing together a national panel and a task force to right. study possible options, allowing states, oh, throwing mm -hmm. it open to the states. Who, who wants to give this a go? Who wants right. to see if they can make some kind of alternative work? Because what we have isn't working. The, the, the conservative argument I got on a telephone town hall once with Buck McKeon about the, when the Affordable Care Act was uh, was going on, and I asked him about, um, you know, what 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 is the problem with the public option? Mm -hmm. And his his response was, uh, it's going to hurt private insurers. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the case? Not if they're nimble, if they can figure it out, right? Well, and then, I, then it's about it's about cost containment for yeah. them and and how they run their business model. But look, here's how I explain it to people when they say, well, what do you mean healthcare is a human right? And I said. If you are out for a walk at the park yeah. and an elderly person has fallen in front of you yeah. and, and clearly they're in distress, they've had some mm -hmm. kind of injury, do you stop to help? Right. Everyone says yes. Yeah. That's how you know healthcare is a human right. Mm -hmm. Everyone stops to help that person, right? Yeah. Sure. So, so you, you don't then say to that person, I'm sorry, you don't have an insurance card and you keep walking your dog, yeah. right? So right. Th this is how we know. It, it, it's that fundamental. Again, just like we're far too wealthy a nation for anyone to go hungry, we have far too many resources here for people not to be seen for illness. Okay. Know, we take care of. What are we going to do about the border situation? 
Well, right now, um, as it has been and as it was during the Trump administration, it's a humanitarian crisis. And so a couple of approaches to take. First of all, make sure that we're being thoughtful about people who we are admitting in this moment. And mm -hmm. I know we're taking in a lot of those um, undocumented, particularly minors, which just breaks my heart. Like if you, you're a parent, I'm a parent. If you put your mind around where a parent has to be to let their child travel right. over deserts and across a river and potentially over a wall or under a wall mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is that they have to do to to get here. You've got to be at such a point of desperation mm -hmm. as a parent to let that happen. So being mindful of just what that mindset is, that these are our, our fellow humans that we walk this planet with, right? right. Our fellow parents. Um, we've got to be, uh, we've got to treat these people with dignity and with respect and make sure they're being well cared for, that they've got a place to sleep, that we're feeding them in the meantime while we figure this out. Um, I know the San Diego, I think they're opening the convention center to be able to house some of these folks. We do need a, we do need an approach. We need to think about this. I saw an interesting story on the news last night, though, that does say, that indicate oh, that over time, this has tended to be seasonal and cyclical, mm -hmm. that there are a few months out of every year where there's kind of this greater surge. Be mindful of that. And then we need immigration reform. Is the media hyping it, you think, right now, kind of trying to find something wrong with Biden? Well, I mean... Yes and no. I think on the one hand, they're hyping it, but on the other hand, it's important to shine a light on it, right? Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that people are being treated with kindness and dignity and respect and no one's being hurt and abused, which is part of why we have border security in the first place, right? right? That very vulnerable populations tend to be victims of things like human trafficking. And there is drug trade that happens on the border and, and people can get caught in very bad circumstances when all they're doing is coming here and seeking a better way of life. So I think the fact that the press is covering it is good, but I think the press needs to be mindful of the fact that this administration literally just got in place right he was mm -hmm. sworn in on january 20th we're, we're literally just over three months in right now and they are working on it right um so what they need is the support of the american public to say yes we we honor and and value our fellow human beings we mm -hmm. want to see them treated well but we've got to fix the problem and the challenge and another big part of that that i wish everyone was talking about more is you know america used to have this really great role internationally in foreign aid. Mm -hmm. And if these immigrants that are coming, especially at the border, are coming from the Northern Triangle countries, why aren't we doing more there? Why aren't we providing more food assistance and things that could be helpful to those populations there so that a mother doesn't have to send her child? Well, I, saw a, uh, I saw a report on the news recently where it talked about when Mexico was doing uh, the best, when its economy was really booming, mm -hmm. that the border crisis went down dramatically yeah. because I think we were funding and helping Mexico yeah. on, on different levels. And, and, and as a result, that the crisis went uh, decreased considerably. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's part of our it's look, a proven, we, we track, are, proven thing. Right. We are also now a global community and mm -hmm. we've got to think about that you know yeah. the, the world itself and i you know i know that some in the more conservative movement are very fixated literally on physical borders but you also talk about the fact that of the 11 million people who are here in the united states in an undocumented status many mm -hmm. of them came on a work visa or on a student visa or on a travel visa right and they overstayed and we have such a convoluted complex and inaccessible system that it is not always the easiest thing for them to do the right thing when they want to do the right thing um to to become documented and you know we, we need to be thoughtful and mindful of that reform the system but first and foremost our priority as Americans, has to be treat people with dignity and respect. Should we um, try and get back into the Iran deal? Yes. Without question? Yes. Okay. Uh, why? Uh, Israel is our greatest ally mm -hmm. uh, in the region. Part of it is, is making sure that we are keeping Israel secure. Mm -hmm. um, I am someone who is a you know, proponent of, of limiting nuclear proliferation mm -hmm. uh, writ large. Um, and we... That's that's a space that that we need to be in for those two primary reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, the argument that the the right would say was that it was a bad deal, mm -hmm. um, that we were paying them rant, uh, paying ransom of theirs or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, gave them a bunch of money and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I I don't I don't get. It, it it seems like from walking away from the deal, they've they've gotten closer to a nuclear weapon than they ever have been. Sure. You, you know what I mean? Right. Um, 
what say you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I'm not an, I am not an expert on where Iran is in terms of their mm. nuclear capability and development, and, and we probably do need to lobby for an international effort to have inspectors in there yeah. again and making sure, you know, that they're living up to, you know, their, their end of whatever remains of, of um, agreements internationally. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, look, I think that the Trump years were not good for foreign relations mm -hmm. writ large, right? Unless there was something that could be extracted, um, a golf course located, a, you know, a new housing tower built, that kind of thing. Um, he didn't really do a lot to advance our cause internationally, and we have a lot of rebuilding to do. Did, he, did Trump do anything good at all that you approve of? We didn't get into a prolonged foreign conflict. That's it. <laughs> Look, I, I, here's a, a UCLA researcher just came out with a study that my dogs aren't a fan. Yeah, of with the, the, with the right policies, four hundred thousand American lives could have been saved mm -hmm. in COVID. Mm -hmm. um, the economic devastation, the challenges that have been wrought, millions of women in particular um, being out of the workforce now mm -hmm. um, because of the scourge of of COVID. What has happened to race relations? in this country as a, as a direct result of, of rhetoric that was all mm -hmm. wrapped up um, in that administration. Um, you know, and, and it depends on what side of the aisle you, you fall on. If, you are, if you're for tax cuts for people at the very top that, that didn't trickle down benefit to, to everybody else, he was probably your guy. Does but, he deserve credit for the vaccine? Um, no, I think the scientists of, of the globe deserve credit for the vaccine. Agreed. Because yeah. I, I, you know, I, I was on Facebook arguing with somebody today the other day, and they said you have to give him credit for the vaccine, and I'm like, well, it's kind of what any president would have done. It, you know? he, he literally pulled us out of the World Health Organization, which yeah. is a consortium of of leading global thought on the issue. Yeah. So if it had not been for independent researchers at these global companies and at the university level, mm -hmm. capitalizing, building on work that had had been done. Um, already and now you know in in the tech era this ability to kind of communicate in real time with each other as these developments were unfolding i mean uh hats off to them the um did trump deserve to be impeached both times was he guilty both times you think i think the evidence was there that he was guilty both, both times. times i think i think the case um for incitement on january 6th was phenomenal i i think that that those prosecutors just laid it out impeccably and it was delivered so well. Now we'll see, you know, if, if anything criminal uh, comes of that. But th there was there was a direct correlation. What about the first impeachment? Which, which it just baffles me that we can actually refer to two impeachments for one president. Yeah, and I think what concerned me about that was kind of this where we were on this slippery slope of acceptable behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And we knew that he would be someone who would kind of push those boundaries of, sure. oh, you know, we were just shooting the breeze. I didn't mean to, you know, imply that there was going to be any quid pro quo. Um, we've got to get back to a place of a higher level of transparency and ethical conduct on mm -hmm. behalf of our elected officials. And a lot of that comes from the press. And the press needs to start chasing those kind of facts and evidence and real stories, mm -hmm. both domestically and globally, and not making it about what seems like sometimes more reality TV headlines. I mean, the fact that Biden yesterday in his first press conference was asked whether he plans to run again in four years the, the guy's been there you know like less weeks, than 100 days literally less than 100 days and you're asking him if he's going to run again because you want to talk about you know the the big cage match between him and trump again when mm -hmm. he, when this as a presidency he has got so much on his plate and there are so much more important things happening globally right is yeah. we, we need to do better we as consumers consumers of news and media need to demand more and mm -hmm. and do better um and, and we need to be having conversations about the right things. We've witnessed two shootings in yeah. the last week, uh, Atlanta and uh, um, uh, Colorado. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, first of all, do you own any guns? I do not. Anybody in your family? Uh, former stepdad owned quite a few. Quite a few, okay. Mm -hmm. um, what is your thought on um, uh, uh, gun guns in general? Uh, well, you know that I have been a, a big prom proponent in, in that movement. Mm -hmm. My voting record in, in the state legislature reflects that um, both cases are absolutely 
horrific and, and tragic. And we need to be thoughtful about who has access to guns and what kind of guns and how many and how, how much ammunition. Um, I, I don't know why an average citizen needs an assault rifle of any kind, whether it's an AR. They make fun of folks on our side that we don't know what ARs, Armalite, you know. Mm -hmm. um, why do you need that? You're not going to use it to take down a deer. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really much of a hunter. You're you not, you know, it, it, right, it, that, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and that that culture and that mentality around it, and I understand Second Amendment proponents, and I am an, I, yes, we have a Second Amendment for a reason, but the words in the Second Amendment literally say a well-regulated militia mm -hmm. and continues from there, right? We have completely abandoned the well-regulated part, and we need to get back to it. It, uh, it also, I always think in terms of the fact that when the Second Amendment was written, it took 15 minutes to load a weapon yeah, to shoot one you time. had your little lead ball and yeah. you had to, yeah, do do the thing and your musket, fife, and, and you, drum. you can't and help but wonder if, if our founding fathers uh, might have taken a step back and, and, and if, if, if an AR-15 existed at that time. Completely, because these, these were completely thoughtful people. Mm -hmm. I think at the time, and sure. and that was again we've a couple times we've touched on this this notion right that our constitution was written to be expansive and mm -hmm. written to be able to evolve over time. So right. given current context, but even w even in current context, yeah. well regulated is right in there. Mm -hmm. Lean into it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, it's time for Ryan's question. My son's question for you. I like Ryan's questions. Um, Ryan's question is this. Hey Christy, I heard you got in trouble for making a joke about Mike Garcia being a fighter pilot. Is that true? Why did you do that? Something that, that I said in an online event that I was hosting Im implied um, that I didn't think very highly you know, of his previous career. And, and let me just be very clear about that. I, I do. Mm -hmm. I admire anyone and everyone who has served our great country right. in any branch of the armed forces. I am the granddaughter and, and daughter of, of veterans. And it, w it was not intended in that light. I had subsequently apologized for it, which was you know, the right mm -hmm. thing to do. Is that, is that, is that you done? Yeah. That, that's, you just leave it at that? Right, it was the right thing to do. Um, well, I mean, you know, and I'll just disclose that Mike and I had coffee about a month before this all happened. Mm -hmm. And he and I laughed. He laughed mm -hmm. about the fact that he was talking all the time about being a fighter pilot. Even he knew it was, to a certain point, ridiculous. And he didn't start grasping and uh, clutching at his pearls until you said something. And, and I think... Um, and I bring that up because it just, to me, it was a hack, wasn't it, that was on the online event that, uh, that so I mean, yeah, we any, say things any, in private that, company. Anytime that, that we're in this space now, and especially in the last cycle yeah. where we were doing everything online, fundraisers yeah. online and constituent engagement online, um, people were, were going on specifically with the purpose, again, to do that, the screen grab and the, the, the small mm -hmm. quote that they could turn into um, something else still still doesn't excuse the remark. No, I, but I'm what not I will say is was, but that that my hope is that in this next go round, mm -hmm. we're not focusing so much on biography as we are about policy yeah. and what is meaningful for this district. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, it would it would behoove everybody to do that. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to clear that about. You know, a lot of people don't know the other side of it, or that you know that, that, that it was just a clip of something that was yeah. privately said and yeah. not even meant to be a, a malicious and in, in, no. in any way. No, not in any way. Um, okay, let's have some fun. Okay. All right, because uh, we're going to wrap up because my battery is dying on my f on the uh, recorder right now, so we're going to have to... All okay. right. Um, in a cage match Yeah. between Bruce Springsteen and God, who wins? Oh, I don't know. Springsteen's kind of scrappy, but I don't. I've never met God in person, so I don't know what his superpowers are. <laughs> I think we'd have to go with God on that one. I can't see That's God wrong. really. That's I can't wrong. see God getting in the ring. Yeah, uh, it's a trick question. <laughs> Springsteen is God. <laughs> Springsteen is God. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, if you were in a room right now with uh, Mike Garcia, what would you say to him alone? Uh, hello. That's it. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd be hard pressed to not, um, particularly given my my background, just ask him about the Violence Against Women Act. I mean, that one, he, he's, he's taken a, a couple of really bad votes, but that one, I, I just don't understand. Did MASH go downhill after Radar left? 
I, I watched MASH, but I don't, I couldn't put that in context for you. <laughs> okay. Favorite character on DuckTales? On DuckTales. I don't I wasn't a big DuckTales ah, watcher, see. but you said you liked Scrooge McDuck at one point. So That's I don't right. know. Is he, That's yeah. my tattoo. I, love, I like Donald, though. I like Donald. Liked Donald yeah. I can never understand what he's saying. Yeah. Although, here's a little side note. Um, yeah. If you ever watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit and the moment where Daffy and, and Donald Duck are playing piano together uh-huh. and you can't quite understand what Donald Duck is saying, it sounds like, I don't know if it is, he's saying a racial epithet at Daffy Duck. Oh, it's that's really not good. it's really weird because he says and, yeah, yeah. and it sounds you know oh wow it's uh, so uh, I haven't seen that movie in years yeah, but now it's it's so. kind of interesting just to, hmm. you know, to see that um, you are familiar with Guardians of the Galaxy correct yes. and the Marvel stuff like yes. that what does I am Groot really mean to you I don't know I just love that I love that that little guy and it, it also reminds me one of my favorite sayings is today's nut is tomorrow's mighty oak <laughs> you know mm-hmm. the, the, the nut that held its ground and so it kind of reminds me of that too he's just like very this is like very self-identified but it's such a great character yeah um what's something about you that most people don't know that you're willing to well now, now you've shared i i had a slight mohawk faux hawk situation mm-hmm. um at one point um love chocolate known to swear um <laughs> you have a temper yeah, I mean, I don't think that's, you know. I, think, I, I get frustrated yeah. with things that I consider to be unjust. And sure, I, sure. Yeah. 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 And, we, and you and I have gone at it a couple of times, which is going to yeah, be kind of fun. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, like, look, the good, the good thing about this yeah. dialogue and the great thing about being an adult, which we all should be doing in a civil society on social media or yeah. not, is that you talk through differences and yeah. you get to a point where you agree to disagree, but at least I understand Mm-hmm. where you're coming from right and i feel like anytime you and i have been in an impasse we do that yeah um absolutely so yeah i think that's and i respect you more, more for it you know and, you know what i mean you, yeah you, likewise you, you, you hold your your to your guns and and, and we we talk it out and and whatever so yeah. uh the, um what's something that you've never told anyone that you're willing to tell us now not much of a secret keeper I, i'm kind of an open book like i will share embarrassing mm-hmm. moments and things um there's not much about me that people people don't know, which is interesting because when you're in this business, people mm-hmm. think they know all kinds of things about you. Like you right. hear all kinds of weird stuff, but it, none, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you were elected, uh, what do you think, what kind of concrete differences do you think this district would see? Well, look, I pride myself on being really accessible, mm-hmm. right? That people can, get, I, I still have, I'm in Facebook Messenger and, and uh, you know, direct message on, on every platform, still working with a couple of constituents carried over from the state mm-hmm. assembly who are, who are facing hard times. Um, people will have a seat at my table. They'll be able to have a conversation with me. Maybe not everybody every day, mm-hmm. but there will be points and there will be venues where i I pride myself on interacting. I enjoy it. That's the good part of the work, right? That right. is the stuff you do on the ground because it's it's that context, it's that on the ground context mm-hmm. that actually makes you a better legislator. If mm-hmm. you get back to Washington D.C. on a Monday morning and you spent the weekend talking with advocates who are helping the unhoused population, you saw in real time what the challenges are, what the circumstances are, what people are up against, what the needs are, right? And that informs your process to be able to do a better job. So I, I'm not a huge fan of people who come back and, and do district appearances and it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and posing mm-hmm. with plaques and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Some of that's a necessary part of the work. Don't you like you also, plaques? I do, and I, and I like acknowledging good people who have done good mm-hmm. works. So I shouldn't be dismissive of that, but I think also just adding context to the work that you do sure. by immersing yourself in it's incredibly important. You have a Band-Aid close to your eye right now. I do. Let's clarify that uh, that did not happen at the last podcast. That we no, to this week. And, no. Uh, were you in a bar fight? Yeah, you should see the other guy. No, yeah. it's a cautionary tale about people wearing their sunscreen. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, teenager in the 80s and, and beach days, we were with the, you know, tropic oil and not, not necessarily um, the kind of protection we needed. So I had to have a little piece of my face uh, removed. <laughs> so, yeah, got some stitches under there. Okay. And what's your favorite board game? Othello don't know that game it's fun it's kind of like connect four meets checkers a couple other games thrown in um it's already too complicated for me no but it's <laughs> it, go, it goes fast and yeah. it's fun and it's str- it's strategy but you got to do the strategy fast okay All yeah right. uh pineapple on a pizza 
Sure, occasionally. Occasionally, okay. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think you made I, some, I lost some votes there. I, yeah, Canadian bacon you, pineapple though. pizza. Like, I'm with you. Yeah, pineapple I, on a pizza, but yeah. pizza is the best vehicle for experimentation, right? I mean, like, there's just all kinds of good things you can try. Favorite Muppet? Animal. But you won't do me an impersonation with it. it just, I mean, all he did was beat the drums and have the crazy hair, but he was just such a relentless spaz, which I think would feel so good sometimes, right? To just, just like, yeah. Just, yeah, just go there. Well, uh, since you won't do that, can, can you give me a Yoda impersonation? Oh, gosh, he's another one that I love. Um, I'm not very good at him, though, but he, uh, I just, I, I loved just his, his being. What advice would this. Yoda give you, if you for running a campaign? What do you think he would say? Oh gosh, I don't know. That's a good one. What would Yoda say? I don't know. Thank you. I wrote that one down last night. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm gonna have to give that one some thought. All right, go go back through the movies. You'll come back and see us. I I hope. Oh, absolutely. Always happy to. All right. Uh, Well, we're gonna wrap things up here, and I'm just gonna tell you, I I I wish you very much luck in the campaign. Thank you. Um, Not the talk of Santa Clarita, not rated free Santa Clarita, but myself personally, for the first time, I'm going to endorse a candidate for. uh, for a political position, and uh, that is you for Congress. And, uh, and I'm going to say this honestly. I, I've interviewed uh, practically every politician in town, and I have never met anybody more qualified that knows more about what needs to be done and how to do it than you. Oh, thank you. Um, it, would, it would be a disservice for you not to serve in Congress. Thank you. So, uh, you know, that. you have, for what that's worth, thank you. <laughs> you may have lost votes. No, thank <laughs> you. Can I, and can I put a caveat on that? You, yeah. you do such an incredible public service by providing this long form format, which we mm-hmm. don't ever see in local yeah. media anymore. And I want you to keep doing it. But anybody who's considering coming on your show from the other side of the aisle, you are fair, you are balanced, you give everyone the opportunity to, to be who they are in a really fair environment and circumstance. So as much as I appreciate your support of me, I want I want all elected officials Mike to Mike is always welcome to, to come back. I, yeah. I, I, I tell people that you know, the whole goal of the show is for me to understand. You know, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. if, if I even if I don't agree with you, I may call you out on what 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 you're saying, but I'm 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 trying to understand why you believe that way. You yeah, know what I mean? Why, why you think that way? And, and this I, is and this is the only format in Santa Clarita that allows that kind of conversation, and it's important. So right. I appreciate that you still do it. Oh well, thanks. Um, okay, well, Christy, thanks so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on your run. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, 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 and and I, we hope you guys enjoy the talk. You've been listening to the Talk of Santa Clarita. Listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud.com, YouTube, and Stitcher. Barring a life event getting in the way, a new podcast is available every Tuesday. Questions, comments, and show ideas can be sent to the talk of Santa Clarita at gmail.com. You can also call or text us at 661-505-8672. That's 661-505-8672. Follow us on Twitter at the talk of SC or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at the talk of Santa Clarita. You can also visit our website by going to www.thetalkofsantaclarita.com. This has been a production of Radio Free Santa Clarita Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To donate, go to radiofreesantaclarita.org slash donate. Radio Free Santa Clarita, on the net and on the air, and we're very much aware. Any questions?